views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh, it is so amazing. I'm Dr. Pat. I'm joined here by my sidekick, Mr. Benny. Hi, Pat. How are you today? Doing very well. Thank you. I know. We got our New York on. <laughs> me or you? <laughs> I don't, but maybe you do a little bit more today. Yeah. Just call me Alicia Keys. No, I'm only kidding. Um, but, you know, what we've got today is shows that are going to make you think, going to open up your heart. I'm going to give us all an opportunity to heal. That's what I love about how Linda lines up some of the most incredible people. And, you know, not just the show before, but this show. And then at one o'clock, I want to make sure you all tune in to Transformation Talk Radio for Lime Talk Radio. So today it is about opening ourselves up to what more to be revealed. I want to introduce all of you to Adele Paula Royce, who's joining me here today. Um, Adele is the author of uh, The Little Black Book of Suicide Notes. And we have three copies to give away on the show today. Um, And there are many, many, many reasons for us to be reading this book and understanding the essence of it, but more importantly, to be understanding what happens to those that are here that now, but those that are also gone. What is it when we look at the mind and the heart of a tortured soul on the verge of ending her own life? Now, for me, I'm very fortunate in one way because my mom also wrote notes They weren't exactly suicide notes in the way we might talk about them today, but they were notes to say how tortured she was, how how hard this life was. Um, Her first attempt at suicide, she talked about why, you know, what was going on. So often we don't understand these notes and we certainly don't understand uh, in this society the event itself. But today, I am thrilled to be introducing all of you to someone that has taken on a what I believe is one of the most important conversations of our time. And if you live in the Pacific Northwest, and you're not familiar with what the suicide rates are here, or if you're someone that has heard, you know, one of the fastest growing segments of, of society, you know, our youth, you're going to want to listen to this show. We're going to give three copies of the book away. You know, Adele Paula Royce uh, it lives in New York City, uh, my old stomping ground, and she has worked her way into the corporations, but you're going to hear more about her life and what it is she's been able to do to bring her artistic essence forward to touch the hearts of so many. Adele, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to really bring this message out to the world. And in hearing your own story, you know, touching my heart, and hopefully we'll be able to together open the hearts of many more people and start the conversations 
you know, coming to a head someplace where they really need to be. Mm-hmm. And maybe at that point, um, try to, I don't know, eliminate is the proper word, but maybe yeah. lessen the epidemic proportions at which this disease has grown. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And I, I think that, that, you know, as a society here in the United States, um, I think we're in denial about a lot of things, but I think this one topic right here, I think that there is just a bunch of heads in the sands, not really wanting to look deeply. Um, let me ask you a question. As the author of this book and taking this mission on, what do you believe is one of the most important aspects of bringing this book and this conversation to the forefront? Very interesting question, and I think that's a great way to start. And I think I can contribute to the knowledge and the emotional state of people listening um, as to why, you know, people in general as a society, everyone's very busy, everyone's living their lives. A lot of people are living what I consider to be, by observation, a less than spiritual existence. And for someone like myself who has been through a lifetime, (laughs) you know, I said these words didn't come out of thin air. You know, most people say to me, how much of it is fact, how much of it is fiction? And I say to them, you know, well, it's kind of like six of one, half a dozen of the other. (laughs) You know, it's basically, um, you know, fiction based on life experience. So when I talk, Mm -hmm. I talk from experience to some degree, and hopefully that will help some people shed some light on an otherwise dark and dreary corner of existence. You know, many of us really live in what my teacher um, calls a false state of emergency, and I think this is really a key issue for people to understand, and it's born out of a non-spiritual way of Um, formulating your life or approaching your life, I think would be a better word. And I'll just explain what that is. You know, a full state of emergency is reacting to something that feels real, but is not in essence true. And those are two distinctly different issues. So my teacher would always give these two examples, and I say these on most interviews, but I think they're well worth exploring over and over and over again because they are such key issues, and it helps in the reconditioning of a lot of our belief systems and what we fear. So one true state of emergency, he would always say, is if someone were, not to be too graphic, but pointing a gun to your head, okay, ready to pull that trigger. Another might be if a grizzly bear were coming toward you ready to attack. Now those, Pat, those are true emergencies, life and death situations. However, you know, when one is full of fear and anxiety and pain and all of these other false selves and inner terrorists and untruths that really attack us, so to speak, even though we might be full of these feelings, these sensations, we are not under any actual kind of threat. So what might feel very real to the one experiencing it it is by no means true. So through this woman's story, you can learn that you don't have to live this way and that there is a way to conduct your life and live your life in a more balanced, sane, sober, and simpler way and not a destructive one. So that is, I believe, one key issue of where people kind of fall off the cart, so to speak. They're living in a way that is not true. I mean, truth is basically what's facing right in front of you. You know, there was one saint, I believe, that said, face what's in front of you and the rest will be revealed. Yes. You know, by evidence of the suicidal epidemic, you know, I say that staying in the moment, you know, the the past, they say, is dead, buried, gone, doesn't exist. The future are stories of things that don't exist. You're making up accounts of things you really have no knowledge of. 
and taken to the nth degree could bring you into possibly, I'm no doctor, I'm just a regular gal, but did a lot of exploration, bring you into a state of psychosis or possibly schizophrenia. You know, you're yeah. thinking about things that just aren't real. So staying in the moment and really living that moment well is a fundamental function of a sane life or a normal life, so to speak. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And that's why I say that the rates of people that are actually in such pain and going through so much suffering and all of the terror that they do experience, to realize, number one, that they're not alone, to realize that suffering is innate, it, it's it's a part, a fundamental part of human existence. You're born into the condition. It's how you journey through and out of it to the other side. And it's work. You know, it's not really handed to you on a silver platter. I always say that some people are touched by the hand of source or God or the universe or whatever you might want to call it. But nonetheless, there is work involved in understanding what our purpose in living is. Yeah. And, you know, what I want to say about this is uh, you said this so, so beautifully. And, and, and here's the takeaway. What if we could just do the next indicated thing? What if we could just do that next indicated thing? What would then get revealed to us? And what is it about the little of this book here today, which we're going to have three copies give away, the little black book of suicide notes. What is it about the stories in here that definitely talk to what Adele said? Where do we go with our minds? Why is it, especially for women, that having psychotic breaks is on the rise? Stay tuned. We're going to take that on and much more. We'll be right back. Another night and here we are again All our faults lay out ahead Take your own journey with the angels with Claire Candy Huff's Heaven Sent Guided Angel Meditation CD Letting go of concerns and living in the now. This beautiful CD walks listeners through practical exercises to help free them from the burdens, worries, and concerns of daily life. Walking a quarter of the way across the bridge, you see a bright emerald green light and sense a loving presence. This is Archangel Raphael's green healing energies, nourishing and revitalizing you. Take a moment now to bathe in this green healing light. Giving you much more than just relaxation and stress release, this wonderfully narrated CD provides vivid visualization, soothing and inspiring music, and an angel's choir that will bring you peace, clarity, and a newfound awareness. Visit angelhealinghouse.com today. What is a brilliant culture? And how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you design a culture that is authentic, innovative, and successful. Learn how to create change with Cultural Brilliance Radio, the DNA of organizational excellence, and Claudette Rowley. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit ClaudetteRowley.com. Be unstoppable. Who do executive women count on for up-to-date information on everything from stilettos to being heard in the boardroom? To achieve excellence, you must first take control of your life and develop a successful strategy with the Unstoppable Diva. Tune in to Up or Out with Connie Fife, Mondays 5 p.m. Eastern, as she cuts through the BS to guide you to become bold, connected, and unstoppable. For more information, visit uporout.com. 
Treat the body and expand the soul on June 1st with Lynn Brown. Imagine three days in a hand-built log home nestled in the Cascade Mountain. Activate the collaboration between the body and spirit and allow the accelerated connection as one of the most powerful ways to light up your cells, honor the body's needs in this all-inclusive event. Visit lynnmbrown.com or call 206-931-7356. You, yes you, can be the highest version of yourself. Wellness coach and natural beauty expert Dr. Agnes Renkel is on a mission to help you play the game of your life. Win in vibrancy, health, and beauty because you deserve it. Dr. Agnes goes beyond the limits in her personal coaching sessions to revolutionize health and wellness. Now is the time to unleash your true power. For more information, visit dragnesfrankel.com. Tune in to The Truth is Funny with Colette Stephan each Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This hit show will have you thinking outside the box and riding the wave of infinite potential. Join Colette on the Higher Self Network, inspiring listeners to shine their brilliance and ensure success while roaring with laughter as they recognize the humor of the giant cosmic joke. Visit TheTruthIsFunny.com. Let it out, then let it right back in All those voices in your head And we both know everything that we can learn Hey everybody, um, I'm just really thrilled to have Adele Paula Royce joining me here today. Now, the book is called The Little Black Book of Suicide Notes. And if you were to see the picture, it would not be exactly what you think you think and we actually have three copies of the book to give away um when i look at this book i i i read so many things in here adele everything from um you know what does it mean to prepare uh also what is it what does it mean to say goodbye and there's so many things in here and i shared with you that my stepmom kept my notes from my mother which nobody knew about what a difference that made. But I want to ask you, how have you changed? How has your exploration into uh, what many people are in denial about, how have you changed? And what is it that has struck you most by taking this project on? Well, Pat, I think that one of the fundamental changes that occurred was the realization of the purpose of living. You know, a lot of people think that the purpose of living is to get to a non-disturbed state, you know, avoid pain, have pleasure, kind of like the child syndrome of I want what I want when I want it, mm-hmm. or throw your tantrum, so to speak. Well, this is kind of an adult way of viewing that. And I think that I wanted to share this story with the world to let people know who are suffering that there's still hope. Because in answer to the question, after years of spiritual searching, and I know you are on a path and will understand this, and I'd like to bring it to your audience, I had a realization, and I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, that fundamentally, in essence, there really is no cure for suffering. It's something that is built into this life of ours when we're born, and we are basically spending the rest of that time trying to find a way out of that dualistic situation of being in conflict and split apart from the inception. You're kind of finding your way back to the one, whatever that one might mean to someone. Like I said, it's a big universe out there, and I'm speaking from the point of vantage point of being an adult and seeing the world is very large. It's not from mm-hmm. a child's perspective where everything looks big. So you're living in a very large universe. It's worlds upon worlds upon worlds. And to realize that we're all part of it and that the suffering is part of it and everybody suffers. I would be hard-pressed to find someone who woke up this morning and didn't have something that hit them in the face 
and uh, affected to some degree their day. So it's realizing what the purpose of living is, and it's basically to find love, to find light and to find love and to share and give. And these sound like very easy, cliché-ish qualities, but they're very difficult um they're difficult things to relate to if you're coming from a place of suffering. So I guess what this is, the novel is comprised of 27 suicide notes, and they're written by a woman on a spiritual journey from life to death to rebirth. And again, as you had said to me, they, you know, they aren't suicide notes left behind, per se. They're a series of reflections, journal entries of a sort, that actually chart her emotional and spiritual journey as she confronts the question of whether or not life is actually worth living. And it gives us an intimate look into that experience of hopelessness. And through the journey, it highlights her desire to find a way out. And there is something else that I just wanted to kind of piggyback onto that regarding the fundamental question of whether life is or not worth living. A lot of people struggle with that, and some to the point of no return. You know, Albert Camus, and I quoted in the book um, to your audience, I'll just brush over it if they're not familiar with his work, is a French, was a French philosopher and a writer. And he used a very powerful quote um, from the myth of Sisyphus. And that was based on a Greek mythological figure. Oh, gosh, she was just like plummeting this, this boulder up and up and up a hill. And basically to no avail, pushing it up, well, just con- consistently pushing it up. And every time the boulder would reach the top, it would invariably come back down. So the quote is really similar to life, and that is, is there really more to life? than pushing a boulder up a hill. So I believe that a question is an internal one and how we come to the realization of understanding what it's like to live a life where we're not just on a nanosecond by nanosecond basis pushing a boulder up a hill, but finding some joy, finding some love, finding some life, finding what life is all about. And that's what this it's actually the first part of the planned trilogy, is taking us through. The book is taking us through a life experience of what would actually trigger someone to the point of no return. The second part of the trilogy, which is in the works, is the Little Black Book of Suicide Notes from Beyond, where we'll all take a journey together through the underworld. And we will, in novel form, of course, Uh, interview all of the people, the famous people, the not-so-famous people, I mean, the Hemingways, the Van Goghs, the Gauguin's, the 27 Club, that actually died intentional deaths by their own hand, and find out what they had to say. You know, I even interviewed Cleopatra, so to speak, in the second book. And the third book is coming back to this mortal coil, which is actually coming back to life in a new way, which is the subtitle of this first book. And learning what it's all about. And once you really do understand how this game of life is played, you can function and live and love um, in a different way than most people do live their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I want to ask you a little bit about the book itself. There, There are a number of notes in the book. Each one of them is, you know, revealing in their own way. Um, I want to ask you this question. Which one, if any of these, has touched your heart most? Interestingly enough, <laughs> <laughs> I do have one. and Well, I have, I have several, but one that I um, am very much a part of 
And that was another trick, learning how much of this was fact, how much was fiction, how I was learning through the protagonist's adventures and story and feelings and the depth of what was going on in her mind. It started triggering things in my mind, which were somewhat triggered to have written this in the first place. Mm -hmm. But it would have been Suicide note number nine, which is the preparation for suicide. And I think that's the one that you even alluded to. <laughs> so we're kind of on the same page. And if you'd like, I could read yeah. a little bit of it and yeah. um, give you an idea, a sense yeah. of what it's all about. Yeah, please. I would love for you to do that. Great. It's fairly short. They're kind of a page and a half, but uh, here we go. The preparation for suicide. I'm getting organized. Not that I want to get caught in the tentacles of time, although somehow I always do. The turbulences of the mind marches on. Living will? Check. Power of attorney? Check. Healthcare proxy? Check. Want to make sure every conceivable plug is pulled for the demise? Just make sure that morphine drip stays on. What's next? Designing the epitaph. I think it should say something like this. Wonderful wife? <laughs> no, that's not right. Wonderful mother? No, that's not accurate. Wonderful lover? Nope, they all disappeared. I couldn't have been all that good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful friend? Nope, nope, nope. Blew most of them off. Never had an interest in listening to anyone else complain. I didn't have the time, patience, or inclination after listening to myself after all these years. Good thing I'm organized. Death takes quite a bit of preparation. I think I might be getting to some peaceful party going on on the other side. I'm coming. Save me a cocktail. Please pour the drink into some delicate stemware. I always had her hang up when it came to proper stemware. I love the fine, delicate wine glasses with the thin crystal stems. But who really cares what I love? I definitely need to get my act together. I need a radical change. I'm in the middle of another usual crisis. I almost feel flipped out. I suppose this whole ordeal should be over very shortly. I just want to stop wasting my time. I can't stand listening to myself any longer. I just use the I word 12 times in the last rant. I can count. That makes it 13. I'm losing interest in my own misery. It's actually starting to get boring. Maybe this requires expeditious behavior. This might necessitate a shift in direction, a shift toward the fatal. It was Shakespeare who said, to thine own self be true. It's like, wow, I'm really going to do this. Now, somehow that seems exciting. That reality could snap anyone out of the doldrums. I tell you, we don't have a shot in hell. The truth is that life is hard and dangerous, that those who seek their own happiness do not find it, that those who are weak must suffer, that those who demand love will be disappointed, that those who are greedy will not be fed. That those who seek peace will find strife, that truth is only for the brave, that joy is only for those who do not fear to be alone, and that life is only for the one who is not afraid to die. And that last verse was from Joyce Carey from Captive in the Free. Mm. Wow, that is powerful. Let's take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back. We have copies of the book to give away for those of you out there. The Little Black Book of Suicide Notes. Adele Paula Royce joining me here today. When we come back, we'll give you lots of information about her, how you can find out more about her, how you can get a copy of the book, um, as well as what are these 10 commandments of suicide? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. To see your life from an angel's perspective, book a personal consultation with Claire Candy Hoff, Angelic Walk-In Angel Ariel at 
Angel Healing House. Candy provides intuitive counseling, Reiki, and angel readings in person in Los Angeles or nationally and internationally via phone or Skype. She will channel the practical tools you need to transform your life. Call now, 831-277-3716 or visit angelhealinghouse.com. Do you feel that there's a bigger, better life for you? Is there anything holding you back from living the life you were meant to live? If you'd like to find your life's true purpose and calling, join the world's foremost authority on primal spirituality. David Carr share in Becoming a Sun Radio, emotional and spiritual intelligence for a happy, fulfilling life. Tune in once a month to Becoming a Sun Radio with David Carr share on the Dr. Pat Show and Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit davidcarshare.com today. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformation Time. Radio. When your body is awakened, your spirit comes alive. Dana Canetto is a transformational guide, embodiment coach, and spiritual mentor assisting women in realigning with their truth and embodying who they are by connecting to the wisdom of their body. Tune in every month on Transformation Talk Radio and the Dr. Pat Show Network for Body Divinity Radio with Dana Canetto. For more information on Dana and her services, visit danacanetto.com. That's D-A-N-A-C-A-N-N-E-T-O.com. Calling all moms, it's time to awaken your vibrant, intuitive, loving self in every area of your life. Join host Debbie Pokornik as she shares thoughts, stories, and tools to help you stand in your power. Listen to Vibrant Powerful Moms Helping Everyday Women Create Extraordinary Lives, Mondays at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. For more information about Debbie, visit empoweringenergy.com. That's empowering with letters N-R-G.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Adele Paula Royce joining me here today. Um, And, you know, we're talking about, you know, the book that she has authored, Little, uh, The Little Black Book of Suicide Notes, which for many of you, you may be thinking, but wait a minute, you know, that's not something I'm familiar with. But Adele, the book is much more than that. You know, it's a book that looks at spirituality. It looks at you know, our mental situation, the connection between body, mind, and spirit, and much more. Um, Before we talk about the Ten Commandments in in the book a bit more, how can people find out more about you and get a copy of it? Oh, sure. Well, it's available through my website, which is AdelePaulaRoyce.com, Amazon, and uh, Barnes & Noble. And it's also, I have a uh, Facebook presence out there, which a lot of people are starting to really catch on to and Mm -hmm. comment, and there's a whole group. And again, it's under my name, it's Adele Paula Royce. So those are different ways that you can connect, and I'd always love to hear from people and become conversational about it, because I think that's one of the triggers that needs to be set in motion. We need to start talking about it. You know, the teacher that I study with and still study to this day, who actually wrote the forward and did the vocal forward on the recording of the audiobook version of this book, I did the notes. And there was also a special um, song in it. We had obtained the rights to Suicide is Painless from MASH, and a very talented artist, Tony Noe, actually did a rendition of that song, and it's wonderful. So it's another um, way of listening to the book, and it might strike the fancy of some people that might not want to sit down and just read this wholeheartedly. Uh But the doctor, Dr. Gerald Epstein, as I say, is my teacher. And, you know, one of the fundamental issues that he raised in the foreword to this book is the misperception of suicide. 
and it's this, the associated element of craziness or insanity about it. I even wrote about it in the author's notes section of the book that, you know, some of the brightest minds of our time committed suicide. It's the stigmatism that suicidal feelings mean that something is wrong with you. Well, guess what? This book is trying to show people that that's not the case. They are not crazy. And that's just how Dr. Epstein presented it. So when you go into the Ten Commandments of Suicide, which is the second chapter of the book, I based ten specific notes on the biblical scripture based on the Ten Commandments. My journey in and of itself, and I know everyone has their own journey through this life, was based on different modalities of learning. First conventional, as I said, there was conventional therapeutic methods, and then there was a spiritual practice that I found about 15 years ago and studied and stayed true to a Western spiritual tradition. Now, I say in the Ten Commandments, I mean, you can basically take this and study this from the East, the West, the North, the South, and Pat, all roads will lead you to Rome. Mm -hmm. They're going to once again tell you the fundamental issue. The past is dead, buried, gone. The future is making up stories of things that do not exist. It's staying in the moment, which is, again, I believe, a very difficult concept to wrap your arms around, but it takes practice, and that's what it's all about. The book is helping someone through this time in a, a real way, in a kind of kindred spirit reaching out to someone who might be mm -hmm. feeling this way trying to bring them back. Also, as I say, I'm not a doctor, but I believe that the homeopathy of like cures like, as I said in the, I believe, the introduction of the author notes, the idea that homeopathically like cures like. Yeah. You take a substance, if you're allergic to something, at one point say I was allergic to wheat. What they would do is they would sublingually give you the exact substance that you're allergic to because in time your body would build up an immunity to that and you would be able to have that substance without being uh, having an allergic reaction to it. It's a similar concept with the book. It's based on homeopathic, like cures like. In some strange way, I say misery does like company. You know, yeah. it's like sales 101. They say, welcome to the pity party. No one wanted to go to work in the morning, so you would stand around and everyone would be convincing themselves of how wonderful they felt to get out there and fight their way through the day. Well, this is a more relaxed way of going through it without the emotional charge of the way most people do it. It's taking it from a point of center and trying to maintain that balance. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thing that I really appreciate that you've done here is there really is a very powerful spiritual thread that I found throughout the book. And having my own uh, experience with suicide in my own family, and being able to read a heartfelt note, um, e albeit, you know, that didn't happen until my dad passed away, but still, it changes things. It gives me a different perspective on things. And don't you find that that's what these are doing for people as well, is, yes, is opening do. up perception? Yes. Because if you really have the courage to look at this, there is a value in everything. Mm -hmm. You know, truth is facing what's in front of you and finding the value of it. And again, not an easy thing to do, but a practice. Yeah. I say if you look at Dr. Viktor Frankl, who was, lived in the concentration camp. Oh, yeah. Basically, you know, suicide is a very complex issue. You're dealing with mental illness, maybe brain chemistry, family life, social structures, and more. I wanted to explore this through a more spiritual and moral dimension, which is often overlooked by our society. 
Suicide is basically a state of hopelessness. You know, when you look at someone like Dr. Viktor Frankl, he would always say that it was in his internal freedom that those captors could not take away from him, something that could not be surgically removed. And the book is about finding one's own path from enslavement to freedom, to find, to tap into the truth of who you really are. You can take this from a physical, emotional, moral, social, mental aspect. You know, if you did not know the opposite of something, a value, you could not know what that value was. For an example, you would not know hot if you didn't know cold. You wouldn't know good if you didn't know evil. You would not know light if you did not know dark. So the value in everything, even darkness, as painful as it might be, to know that you're out of balance and maybe that's the catalyst to start your journey inward. You have free will to do it. It takes courage, but to know that you're not alone, as evidenced by the fact that this book was written. Yeah. You know, there are um, those of us that are out in the world, we're really quite aware of the fact that the level of suicide rates in the United States, in this country in particular, um, is uh, is increasing as we speak. Um, And yet it seems to be one of the more difficult conversations to bring to the forefront in so many ways. But I want to ask you about the part two of the book. And before I do that, Benny, let's open up the phone lines, 1-800-930-2819. Let's give away a first copy of the book. Um, Part two, the Ten Commandments of Suicide. I found, first of all, uh, calling part two the Ten Commandments of Suicide, (laughs) (laughs) right? Um, And then I was kind of surprised after I got here and I started to read this, how enlightening each of these was. And Mm -hmm. I don't mean that from a suicide perspective, but I mean it from an emotional and psychological perspective of what we can now learn more about in the world. Um, How else are people reacting to this? I think that people are reacting in a positive way because they're relating to it. It's a very Mm -hmm. relatable read. And what it's doing is tapping into something that people might not have thought of before. You know, we might be have brought up in different circumstances, different educational backgrounds, different religious, theological. As I say, Mm -hmm. you know, there are many different ways that people are conditioned. And the Bible, you know, the entire Bible, New, Old Testament, the Bible in total. You know, people start asking me, are you talking about the Old Testament? (laughs) There's there's one Bible. It's the Bible. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I found it a fascinating, fascinating. It's sometimes a piece of literature or sometimes an amazing wisdom literature. I mean, I wasn't at the table, I always say, when they wrote it. So in all due respect, I personally found a wealth of information and very relatable information. And I wanted to explore that in a way that was not in any which way, shape, or manner designated to any one particular sect. It wasn't related to specifically Judaism or Catholicism or Islam. It was taken from biblical scripture And it was brought into a format of relatable stories and words. In one, I did an analogy of the man of La Mancha. Mm -hmm. You know, we all kind of just go around this world listening to our minds, which in essence is a great tool. You need to have your mind to know how to get up and go to... uh, an airport, to go to a supermarket, to go Mm -hmm. to the refrigerator, excuse me, and make a meal for yourself. Yeah. But the mind plays lots of tricks on everybody because in essence, it's really 
divided into two structures. It's the tool and the stories. Now, how you utilize that tool is, a, is, is the important issue. And the Ten Commandments of Suicide is taking one by one, broken down, biblical scripture, and making analogies to one's everyday life. And people are finding it quite interesting, and it's a journey <laughs> in yeah. and of itself. Trust me. Well, and, you know, let's talk about this. You're right. I mean, we have a lot of different ways we like to talk about the Bible um, and a lot of different schools of thoughts about what it is and what it isn't. But almost everyone, I think, when you say Ten Commandments, has some kind of idea what the heck we're talking about right there. <laughs> Even if we don't know what that is, what we I, know is they're sort of like, yeah, there are 10 of them and we should really do them. Is that the intention here and in looking at, you know, the 10 commandments that you put in here? No, no. These mm -hmm. were basically the 10 laws of balance. There you go. These, yeah, these are scripture of balance. Yeah. You can follow the Ten Commandments from a biblical, strictly biblical right. perspective, and that's one way of looking at it. I chose to look at it as laws of balance, to keep yourself in touch, in tune, in faith. Because it takes a great deal of faith to live this life, to jump off the precipice into the unknown and not knowing where it's going to take you. That's the courage. That's the energy. If you put your hand under a high-powered microscope, Pat, you would not see solid matter. So there's yeah. more to it than that. We're more to ourselves than just skin in the game, so to speak. You would see wavicles and particles. It's all one big energetic field. So to look at the Ten Commandments, and again, I'm a gal that wrote a book, but if you look at the Ten Commandments in strictly biblical scripture form, you will see something other than you would see from a spiritual perspective, from my observation. It reads two different ways. Same thoughts, same processes, same ideas, but you might be absorbing them in another way. And that's kind of what this did. It was taking it from a spiritual perspective to kind of look at life and say, okay, you know something? I really need to know how not to live so that I can really start to live. And that's the process. Um, you know, for me, I loved going through here and reading these from a lot of different perspectives. One is that it, what you've written here uh, opens up a whole new way of thinking about suicide. You know, it, it opens up a whole new level of understanding of the human psyche, but also the human consciousness and spirituality journey. Um, and here's what I what I want to ask you about. Sure. Any one of these, any mm -hmm. story, any one of the notes in here could reflect someone in our lives that we know today. And what I mean by that is we don't have to look to Hollywood to find somebody that is in here that comes to mind when we read this. No, we can think no. about people close to us, and I think that's that's so important. Is that one of the goals of the book, to really yes. widen our awareness? Yes, it's to enlighten people, to bring this to the forefront, to understand that this is an epidemic proportion. And I did my homework on this path. Yeah. The epidemic proportion of children, the demographics of age 10 to 15, this is mind-blowing and jaw-dropping. What would what would be on the mind of a child, an innocent child, to bring them to a point of suicide, to bring them to a point of no return? Mm -hmm. This is something that is so touching that I felt that I needed to bring it out into the world, into an, an, see it in a new way, from a new perspective. 
that it is an epidemic, that it is growing, that whether or not it's coming from a conditioning, whether or not it's coming from the energies of the world right now, you know, I say the technologies can kill you, the technologies can cure you. It's yeah. wonderful to have technology because of the fact that you can in real time talk to someone or text someone in, in Kuala Lumpur. You know, but basically the energies are moving so rapidly through the universe that the human condition, the human mind wasn't meant to process this. So it's hitting everybody very, very hard. And as you start to realize what's going on in this world, I mean, you're looking at terrorism, you're looking at fear-based existences, you're looking at a world that has so radically changed. And yet, the fundamentals of what is going on here really have not. It's how we're looking at them and how we're processing them. So this book was an attempt, and I say a humble attempt, to try to reach people that might have this inclination, that might be, that might know someone that has this inclination, and to give it a different type of a spiritual vibe, a spiritual feeling, and to bring them around to see this in a new way without the stigmatism. You know, I will say one thing that I think you'll find interesting, at least it was very interesting to me, and it's just an aside from the conversation, but it's interesting. I had this proofread for a final read, and there was a gentleman who I think very highly of, very well renowned in his own industry, runs a world-renowned um, organization for helping people, and it runs the gamut. Well, he read one of the notes, and I believe it was in the last note, I had said something to the effect that you don't have a legal right to tell me that I can't, you know, to do this, right. that I'm not able to do this. Mm -hmm. And he said, Adele, you need to take that word out. In some states, it, you know, it is legal for people to tell you not to do this. It's, it's, it's a problem. And I had initially refused to take out the word legal. But when you're looking at some, I did take it out because it would have yeah. been more trouble than it's yeah. worth. And yeah. I think I had gone off the ledge a little bit yeah. <laughs> far enough with the book in and of itself. But basically what I'm saying here is that the society, it's so stigmatized having this suicidal conversation that people are afraid because you could, what, get put in jail? People can incarcerate you? I mean, they incarcerated Dr. Kevorkian, who's since deceased, and I put it in the notes for the humble gesture of trying to people end, you know, help people end their suffering. So there is a legal aspect to it. So lots of people are afraid to explore it. Lots of people are afraid to talk about it. Lots of people are afraid to give their input into other people who might be expressing some sort of desire to end their life. Well, I mean, I think this is really when we talk about this, it is such a, it is such a, how should I say it, expansive conversation because there are so many people um, left behind that wonder, scratch their heads, never know, did I do something? Did I not do something? Could I have done better? Could I have done worse? All of the above. And the way that you, you know, you have brought these stories to life in the book are ways that actually occur as you read it, as if the person were sitting right next to me in the Interestingly moment. Interestingly enough, that is one comment that has been coming in off mm -hmm. the charts. Yeah. People have been saying that I feel as if you're sitting in a room with me and speaking to me. And that touches my heart, that I yeah. am able to make a harmless contribution to someone else's life, wherever that takes them. You know, and the way that you've done this, too, is you, you, you so beautifully use the question approach. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. I remember uh, reading something. I can't remember which one. Maybe it was note. I think it was note number 14, as I remember. Um, and you start out by saying something like, so why is the sky blue? 
And uh, why already, is there no answer to a why question? That's right. right. <laughs> why is there no answer to a why question? And 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 here's what what I'm going to say as we come to the final minutes. I guess more to be revealed. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And basically, the reason there is no answer to a why question is that you just keep asking why. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much for today, Adele. Thank you for bringing a, you know, a very, very powerful, uh, heartfelt conversation to the forefront, because it really does for those of us that have experienced what it's like to lose someone um, who has taken their own life. It gives us a different understanding and a different perspective, as especially the notes from my mom have done. Tell folks again how they can find out more about you and get a copy of the book. Oh, Pat, thank you so much. It's AdelePolaRoyce.com, and it's available in three formats, paperback, E, and the audio book is something very special as well. And that's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble iTunes as well. Uh, Thank you so very much. Uh, Thank you for one last question. Personal message. What would you like to leave us with today? Hope, double exclamation point, to realize that there's a way out other than a destructive one. And once you realize what living an enslaved life is, You can start your journey of coming back to life in a new way. And if you need some help, there's a ton of help out there. Just reach out for it. I love it. For those of you, please uh, stay tuned for another hour. Uh, Rewired Life Radio with Audrey and Michelle on Transformation Talk Radio. Preceding audio was via a Skype call.